Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Utility Sports. And today we're going to talk about the Washington Wizards in a trade guide video. We have a ton of these up on the channel already. So if you're looking for your favorite team, go check the channel out. If you don't see it on there, though, go ahead, leave a comment asking for a specific team you would like to see. The goal is to tackle all 30 teams with these type of trade guides. I've been having a lot of fun recording them. So hopefully you guys have been enjoying them too. Make sure to leave a like and also subscribe to the channel. It lets me know I'm doing a good job in these videos so let's go ahead and get into it now with where the washington wizards currently set and i think it's an important thing to look at before we jump into the video preview and that way you have a good idea of how this team's performing especially if you're not a fan of the team yourself and you just want to know who's going to be available at the trade market well right now the wizards are a team that they're you're going to look to probably be a little active at the trade deadline they're 12 and 20 as of december 21st the day i'm recording this they're one and nine in their last 10 games. Now they did get a win last night. So that was their one win uh, in those last 10 games. It's not been great <laughs> for Washington. And this has been kind of the MO for them the last three, four years where they start out the season really well and everything falls apart. Think about it last year. They did the same thing with Dinwiddie as their starting point guard. Everything was smooth. Beal gets hurt a little bit. The whole thing falls apart. This whole team right now is just struggling to win games. Uh, they actually won last night without Porzingis. So... It's one of those situations that, you know, the whole thing's just a little messy. They're 12th in the Eastern Conference. It's hard to see this team really turning it around. Uh, and they've got some interesting contracts on their roster too. So I think this video is going to be really interesting to talk about. For a video preview, we're going to look at the tradable players and their contract situations, which is really what's going to motivate Tommy Shepard, uh, the lead executive there in Washington, to make some moves this trade deadline, in my opinion. The draft pick situation, will the Wizards look to get draft picks back? How many draft picks do they currently owe? I think having a good long-term outlook at what this team owes and what they currently have in the stash for draft picks is really important when it comes to some of the decisions that we could see them make come February 9th, the day of the trade deadline. Long-term cap space is also really important. For some teams, it's how you can really look to build up long-term, especially with young players. Washington's in a little bit of a trickier spot with that. So when we get to that part of the video, I think you guys are going to see why this team doesn't really have a lot of flexibility. Are they going to be a buyer or seller? I think the answer to that should be pretty clear with how I've already talked about them. But I think when we get to that part of the video, you're gonna really see why I feel the way I feel about them. Uh, I'm gonna really break down why I think that they're going to be in that seller category. And then the projected activity level, which I think is one of the most important parts of the entire video. Uh, and I save it till the end because everything else kind of leads up to why they're gonna be as active as I think they will be. You know, some teams aren't gonna be active, some teams will be very active. So I'll talk about what I think for Washington uh, towards the end of the video. So make sure you guys stay in for that. And let's get into it here now. Those tradable players and their contracts. Bradley Beal, this is a this is a big one. Five years, $250 million. Uh, he's in the first year of that contract. He's got a player option for the final year. And it's a full no trade clause. So... If the Wizards were to even look at trading Bradley Beal, it would have to be to a destination he would want to go to since he has a full no trade clause. If he doesn't want to get traded at all, let's say during the season, he's like, yeah, I don't really feel like moving my family in February. He could just say, no, you guys can't trade me here. And he could say that to all 29 teams. He doesn't have to give them a list. Now, if he wanted out or if he was okay with a trade, he would give them a list of teams that say, hey, I'd be okay with going to these destinations. And there, Tommy Shepard could do some work and try and maximize his value. But really, Bradley Beal controls his own value right now. If he says, I only want to play for one other team and I'm vetoing everything else, the team on that list would not have to give up as much to trade for him because they know that Tommy Shepard and the Wizards have no actual trade leverage here. Because Beal, if he's working incongruent, you know, sense with the other team that he wants to get traded to, he could just veto every other trade. So out of the 29 other teams in the league, he could li literally limit his market down to one if he wanted to, even though he's on a long-term contract, which by the way, I think this is one of the most untradeable contracts in the N or in the NBA. When you look at the fact that it's a five-year, $250 million deal, it's one of those massive brand new contracts that Honestly, it's going to be hard to stomach for a team that's $50 million per year. Uh, and right now it's actually cheaper than $50 million. It, it ascends. So I think the final year of that contract's a, a $57 million player option for when Bradley Beal's 34, 35 years old. It's not a pretty contract. Uh, so 
for me, honestly, if I were to trade for Bradley Beal, I think one first round pick would be my max value I'd be willing to give up. He's it's just not worth trading for that contract, in my opinion. Beal's a really good player. He's an awesome player. Is he a top 20 player in the world, though? No, I don't think so. Kristaps Porzingis, uh, a guy that, you know, I really like Porzingis. I think Porzingis is one of the more underrated players in the league when he's healthy, which is a big if at certain points. He's one of the best players in the world. Uh, you know, again, like I think he's right in that same realm as Beal, where he's a top 25, 30-ish player in the world when he's actually on the court healthy. This year, he's averaging about 21 and 9 uh, with about two blocks a game or so. He's been fantastic for Washington. I think he's been a big part of their success along with Denny Avdia. When those two players are on the court together, they are significantly better than when they're off the court. Uh, and when you look at Porzingis, two years, $70 million. Again, it's a hefty price tag, but it's nearly $15 million less a year than where Beal's at. And I don't think Porzingis is going to be getting a big raise on that contract either. And the other aspect to it, he's got a player option for next year. So when you look at this, Washington really doesn't have any leverage with their two best players, with Beal or Porzingis, because Porzingis could literally opt out of his contract and become an unrestricted free agent this offseason. And Beal, I mean, can pick wherever he wants to go. Right now, I think Washington's in one of the worst situations long term because of these contracts, the way that these are all structured. They don't really have a lot of flexibility to actually improve their roster and keep their good players right now. They're kind of at a point where Beal's going to eat up a lot of their cap space. If they keep Porzingis, he'll eat up the remaining part of their cap space. And without those two, they're just bad. So uh, it's kind of a tough picture to see this Washington team turning things around. Will Barton, he's on an expiring deal here at $14.37 million. I think that they should look to move him. The issue, though, is what team's going to have interest in him. Maybe like the Lakers, maybe a couple of these other teams. I could see Milwaukee. Showing a small amount of interest in Will Barton, but at the end of the day, it's not like you're going to get really great compensation. Maybe a couple second round picks for Barton in a deal. Kyle Kuzma, I think, is one of the more important players this trade deadline. I think he's a player that is definitely going to get traded. Two years, $26 million player option for next year. So just like Porzingis, they're probably losing Kuzma as well. Now it's possible Porzingis opts into his contract and stays for another year. But it still doesn't really improve Washington's long-term outlook or their long, long-term team building if Porzingis opts in. Kuzma, there's no way he's going to opt in. He's going to get significantly more than $13 million a year on his next contract. The one thing about Kuzma, though, that people don't understand, he's older than Kristaps Porzingis. Uh, he's nearly 28 years old now at this point. He's not a young player. Uh, he's like right in the heart of his prime. So if Washington were to lose Kuzma, I really don't think it's that big of a deal, honestly, for them. Like, I think that he's a good player. I think he's a player you'd like to keep. But just with wa where Washington currently is, it seems like they have like eight power forwards at all times. You don't need Kuzma. You just don't trade him, try and get some value for him, and then kind of reset the deck here. Uh, and remove some of your stuff around to to try and make it work around Beal. Because I think that's the goal here. Beal's a, a franchise player for them. And I think one important thing, Washington's not had a ton of franchise players in the last 20, 25 years. You think back to some of the notable guys. Gilbert Arenas, Agent Zero was kind of the closest thing to that before John Wall. John Wall, of course, was the franchise player. And we got to see how important he was to that city when the Clippers played in Washington earlier this year. But Ultimately, the Wizards are, I don't know, for the lack of a better word, kind of void of franchise players in the last two and a half decades or so. Uh, and I think Beal is one of those guys that, you know, they, they look at him as a representative of that. I just don't know if he's good enough to be really an actual true franchise player that can get you to the heights you actually want to go to when it comes to winning. Monte Morris, two years, $19 million. It's not a bad contract. It's just... He's not a starting level point guard. He's a backup point guard, and he's a good one when he's a backup. He's a bad starter when he's starting. So that's the issue. I would say the same thing with DeLon Wright. Decent contract, $8 million a year is not bad for him. It's kind of right in the same price point that I'd be willing to give him. The issue, though, is he's a backup point guard. They have two backup point guards, and they don't have a starting point guard. So by nature, you have to start one of them, and it's just a net negative for your team. So that's kind of the issue. Rui Hachimura. Final year of his rookie contract just has not been impressive. Way back when, when Hachimura was coming out for the draft, I really did not like his game at all. Uh, I thought that he was somebody who just 
was not going to work in today's league. Uh, and I think for the most part, that's been somewhat vindicated. Uh, the contested jump shots, the the way that he plays stylistically, I'm just not in on that type of style. So he's a restricted free agent. I think they would do best by trading him to any team that wants him. Uh, right now, it's kind of hard to picture a team really being interested in him. I could see maybe like Oklahoma City expressing some interest because he's a younger player that they can maybe bring in on a cheap price point. It would work for them. And then Daniel Gafford, he's in the final year of a cheap contract, and he actually has a three-year extension already built in at about $39 million. So the totality comes to four years, $40 million, and he'll be owed about 12 and a half to $13 million the next three years. Not a good contract, in my opinion. I think they overpaid for him. Center is one of the toughest positions to get the contracts right on, especially when you're looking at a backup big like Gafford. $13 million a year is too much for him. I think he's a you know a seven to $9 million a year player. It's not like they're way off on the contract, but it does just limit some of their flexibility and it makes it harder to trade him. If he was at seven or $8 million a year, he'd be very tradable. A lot of teams would have interest at $13 million. It gets a little trickier to find a, a good amount of partners for that. So Gafford for me probably doesn't get traded, but I think that they could look at some offers at least for him. So the draft pick situation, they owe their 2023 first. It is top 14 protected, which will defer to... 2024 my guess is this team misses the playoffs therefore they're in the lottery therefore they keep their own pick new york has the rights though right now to that 2023 first that will defer to 2024 and this was originally sent in the wall for westbrook trade now they did a really good job getting off of russell westbrook when they did uh they fleeced the lakers on that trade there's no question about it but i at the time when they traded wall and a pick for westbrook i didn't really like it for them and this is part of why you looked at the direction of their franchise and you're like, okay, where's this team going to go? Are they actually a good team? Not really. So I didn't like the fact that they gave up a pick in that trade. And now it's kind of coming back to haunt them a little bit because they're probably going to have to give up an unprotected 2024 first, uh, which is, you know, not exciting. Otherwise, they own their own first, though, moving forward. So it's not like they're in a terrible situation with their own draft picks. They don't have any other team's first round draft picks, though, in the future. So this trade deadline is going to be an important one for them when it comes to kind of resetting their book and bringing in some assets to build around this team with. So right now they got a little bit of work to do and their future cap space. Well, they don't really have a lot practical cap space of negative twenty six million dollars makes it hard to see them making moves this offseason other than maybe a mid-level exception at around eleven million dollars annually. It's just when you're paying one player $50 million and he's not a top 20 player in the world, you're kind of at a hard spot in terms of building a winning team. Uh, not to say that they shouldn't have kept Beal and, you know, if they can find a way to trade him, it'll work out, whatever. But I, I just don't like where they're at. I, I really don't. I feel like this video has been a little bit more pessimistic than some of the other ones. So Wizards fans, I'm sorry about that. Giving Bradley Beal, though, a five-year, $250 million deal is just insane. Uh, and I think, honestly, something that's going to be really, really difficult for them to build around and win with. So, you're not going to have a lot of cap space unless they traded literally like everybody else on the team uh, for expiring deals, then maybe they could. But even then, it would be like $60 million in cap space. You use one for a max level, and then you got $30 million to fill out the rest of your team. You'd end up like the Los Angeles Lakers and have a whole bunch of minimum contracts that you know are guys that can't really play at a high level in this league. So it's just tough. It's tough to win with a $50 million player when he's not, when he's not a consensus all-NBA guy every single year. It's just going to be really difficult for them to, to win, I think. So are they going to be a buyer or seller? I think it's pretty clear. They are going to be sellers. They're going to sell a lot. Tommy Shepard sitting outside of his house with a for sale sign right now. And the thing is, if he doesn't turn it around, he might actually have to sell his house and move somewhere else because uh, I just don't think he's done a great job the last couple of years. I think he's had some nice moments, uh, but you look at some of the draft picks, they haven't hit consistently from that 7 to 14 range. They've drafted some okay players in there. I think Kispert's an okay player. I think that, you know, some of those guys that they've grabbed, I, I like Denny Avdia a lot. It's not like they've picked bad players. They just haven't picked anyone that popped. And for this team to have gotten to where they want to go, they needed to draft a guy who would pop. And they just haven't. So 
it's tough to see this team really turning it around and, and going a, a long distance into the playoffs in the short term here. Like if you ask me in the next three years, do I see this team winning a playoff series? It's really hard for me to say yes to that. So I, I just see that there's really not a, a great likelihood that Tommy Shepard is looking to buy this trade deadline. Uh, and I think realistically, he's got to sell whatever he can to recoup value. So who are the teams to trade with? I think the Los Angeles Lakers are a really good example of a team that they should make a move for. Uh, Kuzma. I think Kuzma is the player that is going to have the most trade value from this team this year. A lot of people are going to overvalue Kyle Kuzma. Now I know he's improved significantly in his time in Washington, but I, I'm just not the biggest Kyle Kuzma guy. I'm just honestly not. Uh, I think that his stats kind of inflate his value for a lot of fans and the way that, you know, the media looks at him. Uh, when you watch him play, there's just moments that you're like, okay, Kuzma just took a bad jump shot. Next play down, he dribbles the ball like three too many times, takes another bad jump shot. Uh, there's just things he doesn't do well now. He's a great defensive rebounder. I think that's one of his biggest assets. And I think that would help Los Angeles a lot. I think the Lakers need a little bit more size. So I think Kuzma, he does improve some teams if they were to make a trade for him. But he's not as drastic of an improvement. A deal with the Lakers would probably look like Kuzma for Patrick Beverly. And maybe a 2027 first with like a top four, top five protection on it. Uh, and I think that's probably enough to get a deal done. Just given the fact that Washington's likely losing Kuzma in the offseason anyway. The Clippers here now, uh, I think, are a really interesting team for Kristaps Porzingis. And people might be confused by this. The Clippers, when they're at their best, everybody knows this. They're playing 5 out offense. That's what they like to do. They take Zubats out of the game and they play small ball, which is really skill ball. They want the most skilled players on the floor that they can. Uh, and that usually means Covington in for Zubats at that point. Or you can see Marcus Morris in there. Well, why not? The, why don't they upgrade? their five out into something that's actually really formidable uh, and they don't have to trade size for it. You can play a five out offense with Kristaps Porzingis because of his skill set and you don't have to trade some defensive rebounding. You don't have to get rid of some of your rim protection and size, which are things that I think the Clippers have lacked in the last couple of years. When they go small, that really hurts them. In some big games, I, I think that they are too one dimensional at times. Kristaps Porzingis could really help solve this. Somebody who when he's playing the true center position, he's an elite rim protector. He's very good in drop coverage, in my opinion. I think he's someone who gets criminally underrated for his rim protection element that he brings. Uh, he's had massive games in the past with five, six blocks. He's somebody who can deter shots at the rim. And I think the Clippers need that. So a deal here from the Clippers. They do have a tradable first round pick. You send that to Washington, as well as you know the contracts of Marcus Morris. Robert Covington, and you know maybe a little bit more in terms of salary. I haven't necessarily played with the uh, salary cap as much. I need to look at them a little bit closer uh, when talking about these. But right there, that's about twenty-six million dollars between those two players, maybe twenty-four. So you might have to attach in another, you know, five to eight million dollar contract. They have plenty of options to do that. They've got a bunch of guys on those middling level deals, and they've got a ton of depth. They can afford to send even three players out in a trade here with the pick to get Kristaps Porzingis. I think it significantly improves their value come playoff time. Zubats can then come off the bench with Porzingis. You can actually start in your five out offense, which is really what they want to do anyway. That's what they would prefer to do, but they have Zubats in there because they feel like they do need to have a center. I think they need more size. Porzingis gives it to them without sacrificing the team identity, which I really, really like for them. The Atlanta Hawks now are a team that I could see exploring Kuzma or Porzingis. They have the first round pick from Sacramento that they could look to trade. They also have um, their one of their own picks yet that is trade eligible. And they have a bunch of players who have been rumored in trades in the last six to eight months. You think about guys like Clint Capella, John Collins, who is perennial, perennially excuse me, on the trade block. There's a ton of players that I think Atlanta would be willing to move in a deal. Bogdanovich as well. This would probably get down to a three-team trade here where you know, some of Atlanta's players go to a different team. Maybe a draft pick goes to Washington. Kuzma or Porzingis were to go to Atlanta and then look at some of the other players going out in salary fillers, basically, to Washington. That's what I could see happening here. I think Atlanta's a long shot, but I think they were worth mentioning in this video. 
The Memphis Grizzlies could be a team I could see targeting Kyle Kuzma. I don't think that they should, though. Uh, I think that they should stay away from Kuzma. I like their team identity the way it is. I think Dylan Brooks is already one of those guys who's maybe a little bit too much. I'm going to dribble and shoot. Uh, and it's going to be a long contested two-pointer that doesn't go in like 70% of the time, but I'm going to continue to shoot him anyway. I don't think they need another one of those guys with Kyle Kuzma, although I think he would help them on the defensive glass, something that Jaron Jackson is just not great at. So, and that's really where the benefit is. You could go, you know, Brandon Clark, Kuzma. You could go Kuzma, Jaron Jackson. That's why I think it does make a little bit of sense. Now for them though, offensively, I don't think it really improves them that much. I don't think that they should actually make a deal like this. I like what David Roddy's been giving them. I was very high on him in the draft cycle. I think Jake LaRavia long-term is a decent option too. So I don't think that they need to mortgage any of their future here. I know some people are saying, hey, trade their first this year. Uh, and then that way you keep your flexibility open long-term. That's probably not the worst thing. If I were to make a trade for Kuzma, that's what it would have to look like for me if I was running the Grizzlies. But at the end of the day, I just don't love it still for them. Uh, and I don't think Kuzma's as good of an upgrade long-term as a lot of people seem to think. For the Raptors, Porzingis is a guy who makes sense. They still need a big man. Uh, you know, Coloco's given them some nice stuff. I have a Raptors trade guide on the channel. Go check that out if you're a Raptors fan. I don't think Porzingis is the most likely outcome for Toronto here. But last year, they did express some interest in him when he was still in Dallas. I think he does make some sense for them. But... I, I, I don't see it super likely, but I, I think that there could at least be conversations between these two teams. Miami, they need a four-man. Kuzma, Porzingis both make some sense for them, although it's just hard to see the contracts line up unless Washington, for some reason, was willing to take in Kyle Lowry's contract. And then, you know, Miami gives up a pick or two or something to, to kind of sweeten the deal and get it done. I, I just don't really see it super likely, though. It's kind of hard for Miami to all of a sudden pivot on Kyle Lowry uh, and make a deal for one of these guys. Who knows, though? Miami's always able to pull off some surprises. Pat, uh, Pat Riley's really great at that, so I wouldn't discount it. And then I think any other teams that are interested in Rui Hachimura or Bradley Beal. Like I said, Beal's hard to see get traded just because of where his contract currently sets. I think there's executives around the league that feel the exact same way I feel, where they would look at it and say, holy cow, that contract's enormous, and I'm not sure if he's a top 20 player. I don't think we can make this trade. But I do think other executives would look at it and say, for the, right for the right price, maybe two firsts or something, you look at getting Bradley Beal, he's a really great talent. And if he was surrounded by better players, maybe his ability would be best used to win games. Uh, as a scorer, uh, someone who can be a secondary playmaker for a team, Bradley Beal's an awesome player. I don't want to come across like I'm saying Beal's not great. Beal is a really great player. Uh, it's just, I don't know if he's a number one option for a good team. And I think that's the issue with where the price point is for him in terms of his contract. That's what he's getting paid like. Now, I think like teams that he would be awesome for, Memphis, he would be great if they moved Bain to the three and, uh, you know, played Beal next to Ja. I think they'd be really deadly offensively. Uh, and there's a lot of teams that Beal would make better. I think he'd make Dallas a lot better. But at the price, it kind of limits all the long-term flexibility that team would have once you trade for him, especially if you have to give up draft picks. It's just a hard ask for me, and I don't think I'd be willing to do it. Rui Hachimura, again, this is going to be teams that are looking to explore some younger players. So Houston, Oklahoma City, teams that are, you know, rebuilding. Maybe Orlando could even look into it, although I don't think they would really need him. Could maybe look at Charlotte exploring Rui Hachimura a little bit. I don't love it, but uh, I think it's a potential option for sure. Now, the projected activity level, like I said, one of the most important parts of the video, I think this team needs to be highly active. They need to, they need to, they need to be active this trade deadline. If they're not, it's a failure, honestly, because they're going to lose Kuzma in free agency. It's possible they would lose Hachimura in free agency, probably would lose Barton in free agency, maybe even Porzingis in free agency. So instantly you'd lose like four of your top seven or eight players and you're already a bad team. You'd be way worse without those guys. And because of their current contracts, they wouldn't even really have cap space anyway. So uh, this is kind of a nightmare situation here for Washington if they don't make trades. I think they have to move Kuzma. I think they have to move Hachimura. I think they should move Barton. But if they don't, it's not the end of the world because you're not going to really recoup that great of value for him anyway. Uh, and then for Porzingis, I like Porzingis. If I was Washington, I'd want to keep him around. But it's also very likely you just lose him for nothing. So... 
I think realistically, we're going to see an active team here, though. They're going to be active. And then I think Beal's the guy that could blow up the trade deadline. Uh, I, I don't think it's likely he gets traded, but if you would have asked me that in you know December about James Harden, I would have said, yeah, probably not. I think Brooklyn's just going through a little bit of an issue. Talking about last year, well, James Harden got traded by February. So you never really know. If, if they keep losing a ton of games and Beal's like, hey, look, we're not going to win here. Please put me on a team that can win. I could definitely see it being possible, but not likely, like I said. And I, f- I sort of feel the same way with Porzingis. It's not super likely, but I think it's a little bit more likely than the Spiel situation. A lot of these players would make other teams way better. Kuzma could really help some teams. Hachimura could long-term, I think, help some teams uh, with specific needs. Barton would be a nice depth piece for some playoff teams right now. Porzingis would significantly improve a good amount of teams. I really hope to see he goes to the Clippers. I, I think if he went to the Clippers, they would be probably the favorites uh, in the West. Now, I, I know people would be saying, oh, the most injury-prone team in the league. That's Kristaps Porzingis. Okay. Uh, yeah, but if they're healthy, and I know that's always been the saying for the Clippers, I mean, the more talent you have, the better. And, and Porzingis is significantly more talented than Zubats or any of the other players in, in the deal I was talking about, like Marcus Morris, Robert Covington. Porzingis is better than all of them at a lot of the same things. So I think that for the Clippers, it would make a lot of sense to make that deal for KP, but I, I would understand if they're also hesitant on that. Hopefully you guys did enjoy today's video. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more thank you so much for watching it really does mean a lot to me it lets me know i'm doing a good job here when you hit that like button so please do that thanks again and we'll catch you in the very next utility sports video